Cash is no longer king. Over the years, the use of physical notes and coins has declined in most countries. This is in part because cashless payments by card, phone or QR code are simply more convenient. However, many countries around the world have also been pressurizing their citizens to go cashless in recent years. And depending on how this is done, it could mean the end of financial freedom. So that's why today we're going to explain what a cashless society is, who is pushing for it and why, which countries will become cashless first, and how to make sure you don't end up in a digital dystopia. The concept of a cashless society has been around for hundreds of years. It's not known who coined <clears throat> the term, but it's believed that American author Edward Bellamy was the first to describe the idea in his book Looking Backward in 1888. It's about a socialist utopia where the government controls everything. I think you can see where this is going. In fact, the concept of a cashless society has probably existed since cash itself has been a thing. Obviously, cash includes coins and paper banknotes. As a fun fact, the first coins were minted over 2,700 years ago in the ancient kingdom of Lydia, located in modern-day Turkey. As for the paper banknotes we typically refer to as cash, these were first created in China during the 7th century. In fact, it's believed that the word cash comes from the physical paper banknotes issued in China during the 14th century under Mongol rule. You'll know this if you watched our video about the companies that printed the world's currency. You'll also know that the demand for cash fell after digital payments started to become popular with banks, central banks, and businesses. The first electronic payment was made by Western Union in 1871, FYI. And of course, the most popular form of digital payments are done via credit or debit card. As another fun fact, credit cards actually came before debit cards. The first credit card was issued by the Bank of America in 1958. But the first debit cards didn't come until 1966 from the Bank of Delaware. Funnily enough, the cashless society that Edward Bellamy envisioned back in 1888 replaced cash with credit cards. And he actually used the term credit card 11 times in his book. The catch is that the credit cards he envisioned worked more like debit cards, with the government periodically giving all citizens the same amount of credit to spend. Today, of course, there are many different types of cashless payments, ranging from cryptocurrencies to central bank digital currencies or CBDCs. For the purposes of this video, though, the only thing you need to know about these cashless payment methods is that they exist on a spectrum from centralized to decentralized. At the centralized side of the spectrum, you have CBDCs, which make it possible for central banks to see and control every transaction in the economy. If you've watched any of our many videos about CBDCs, you'll know central banks have stated their intentions to do things like set limits on saving and spending. On the decentralized side of the spectrum, meanwhile, you have cryptocurrencies, which are supposedly not controlled by anyone. But this really depends on which cryptos we're talking about. Some cryptos, like Bitcoin, are very decentralized. Most other cryptos are almost as centralized as CBDCs and can impose the same controls. Most cryptocurrency transactions are also publicly viewable, which can threaten financial freedom, but we'll come back to that later. The key takeaway for now is that a centralized cashless society is a dystopia, whereas a decentralized cashless society is something closer to an actual utopia. Now, most of the cashless payment methods we use today lie somewhere in the middle. Take credit cards and debit cards, for example. If your bank or card provider decides to, say, prevent you from buying crypto, then chances are that you can change banks or card providers. This ability to switch is one of the only reasons why banks and card providers haven't exercised more control over their customers' payments. As time has gone on, however, some banks and card providers have evolved to become monopolies, and this has made them more willing to exercise this control. 
The most infamous example of this on the banking side is the pandemic protests in Canada early last year, when banks froze the accounts of protesters at the request of the government. For context, Canada has an extremely centralised banking system, with only five banks controlling most banking activities. Now, the most infamous example of this on the card provider side, meanwhile, is Visa and MasterCard's decision to start tracking all gun purchases in the United States, a decision they decided to undo in March this year. For reference, Visa and MasterCard issue more than 80% of credit cards in the US. Logically, freezing the bank accounts of protesters and tracking specific purchases sets a terrifying precedent. And yet, it's been one of the main justifications for a cashless society. After all, if everything can be tracked and controlled, then there'll be no more crime and no more corruption, right? Now, based on our research, the push for this centralised dystopian cashless society started sometime in the early 1970s. This makes sense, considering that this is roughly when debit and credit cards started becoming widespread. It's also shortly after the gold standard was abandoned by the United States. If you watched our video about how the financial system is rigged, you'll know that money is a store of value, like gold, whereas currency is supposed to be something that's backed by money. Until 1971, cash, currency, was backed by gold, money. Since that time, though, currency has been backed by, well, nothing. The consequence of this is that the financial system is becoming more unstable. Now, the explanation for why is outside the scope of this video, but the short of it is that abandoning the gold standard made it possible to create unlimited amounts of currency. This has made the boom and bust cycle of the economy much more volatile. There's just one thing to keep in mind, though, and that's that these instability issues didn't arise right away much like the control issues of a cashless society. As a result, it appears that it was primarily banks and card payment providers that were pushing for a cashless society in the early days, meaning the 1970s. This makes sense, since banks and card payment providers stand to profit the most from a cashless society. They collectively earn hundreds of billions of dollars in fees from the hundreds of trillions of dollars in cashless payments they process. Newsflash. Those fees are paid by you and the places you shop at. Following the 2008 financial crisis, however, central banks realised just how unstable the financial system was and started looking for solutions. Most of these involved introducing restrictive regulations that further centralised the financial system. As you've learned, this makes it easier to control the economy. Lo and behold, the justification for these restrictive regulations was identical to the justification for a cashless society. We need to collect detailed personal information about every person and every transaction in the name of fighting crime and corruption and tax evasion. The perfect excuse. But it seems it wasn't until 2019 that the central banks got on board with the cashless society idea. 2019 was when Facebook unveiled its Libra stablecoin project. At that moment, the central banks realised they'd lose control of the increasingly unstable financial system if they allowed a private currency to take over. One year later, the pandemic began, and the resulting restrictions conveniently made it possible for central banks and governments to justify going cashless as much as it was possible to do so. This is also when they started pushing CBDCs. And you can see this on Google search trends. Searches for CBDCs have gone parabolic ever since. And in case you're wondering, no, cash did not contribute to spreading sickness. In fact, a 2020 study by the Bank for International Settlements, or BIS, the Bank for Central Banks, found that the payment terminals used for card payments harboured exponentially more bacteria than cash. The more you know. Anyways, much to the chagrin of the governments, central banks, commercial banks, and card payment processors, cash use is almost back at its pre-pandemic levels in most countries. In some countries, many businesses have even removed the cashless payment options they implemented during the pandemic. 
This sounds strange until you remember that businesses bear the brunt of credit card fees and that being paid in cash means that you can evade taxes, another justification for a cashless society. On the consumer side, using cash helps control your spending. Studies have found that handing over cash elicits a pain response. More importantly, using cash means that you are in control of your transactions, and the only person who can track your transaction is the counterparty in your transaction. And if you happen to be saving cash, it means you don't have to worry about a bank bail-in, where your savings are used to bail out the bank. More about that in the description. I digress. Anyhow, another reason why cash use has been on the rise is because more and more people are realizing that the cashless society most countries are trying to introduce is of the dystopian kind. This is evidenced by the countries that have tried to enshrine cash use into law over the last year, like, for instance, Slovakia. However, there have been just as many countries that have doubled down on their plans for a dystopian cashless society. The country that comes to mind here is Nigeria, where the government is trying to force the adoption of its eNaira CBDC by restricting cash use. Thankfully, this hasn't worked, at least not yet. Hold up a second there, Guy. Sorry to interrupt, folks, but I just wanted to very quickly tell you about the Coin Bureau Deals page. Now, this is the place where we have put together some of the very best deals and promos in all of crypto. So you can think things like exchange sign-up bonuses, trading fee discounts, and money off of hardware wallets, and much, much more besides. So if you want to check that out, coinbureau.com forward slash deals is the place to go, or you can just use the link in the description of this video down below. Thanks very much, and now back to you, Guy. This begs the question of which countries will be the first to go fully cashless. Well, the answer seems to be those in Scandinavia, starting with Sweden. Now, believe it or not, but Sweden has been trying to go cashless since the early 2000s. It serves as the perfect case study for how societies become cashless. For starters, Sweden has a very centralized banking system. The four largest banks reportedly account for more than 75% of the country's deposits and lending. In the early 2000s, these banks started experimenting with cashless branches. By 2019, only half of bank branches worked with cash. This didn't happen overnight. To convince their customers to go cashless, banks had to extend them an olive branch. Now, this came in the form of various products and services that made it easy to go cashless, like the Swish phone payment system in 2012. By 2019, children aged six and older could get a debit card. What's interesting is that the push to go cashless in Sweden apparently began after the 2008 financial crisis. This makes sense when you remember that central banks all around the world started looking for ways to increase financial stability post-2008. Sweden went straight for the cashless solution. Cash use in Sweden started declining after that, but it wasn't until 2015 that Sweden's use of cash really fell off a cliff. This was because the Swedish Central Bank announced that all coins and cash notes needed to be exchanged for new ones. Can you guess the excuse? That's right, to fight crime, specifically counterfeiting. At the same time, Sweden's megabanks started dismantling ATMs around the country, especially in rural communities where cash was being used the most. The practical effect of this was that cash became almost impossible to get hold of. Today, less than 10% of all sales are made in cash in Sweden, the lowest level in the world. What's fascinating, though, is that Sweden's cash use seems to have bottomed around this 10% level over the last few years. This is despite the fact that Swedish banks continue to scrutinize cash transactions, regardless of the amount. Some have refused to accept cash and others have confiscated it from clients, all in the name of fighting crime, of course. To add insult to injury, there have been lots of controversies during Sweden's cashless society transition. Besides technical issues that have reportedly led to bankruptcies, the Swedish government once put out an emergency preparedness guide that included an instruction to always keep some cash on hand. 
What did you say? Anywho, for what it's worth, Sweden was expected to become completely cashless by March of this year, and it seems to have missed the mark by quite a margin. Even so, it begs the question of why Sweden's transition to a cashless society has still been so successful, and why it's a similar story in other parts of Scandinavia. The answer is trust. Swedes, Norwegians, Danes and Finns all trust their governments. The same seems to be true of the Dutch, which explains why the Netherlands is headed in a similar direction, so to speak. The caveat is that trust in governments is declining everywhere, including in Scandinavia. This might have something to do with the fact that it's becoming obvious to the average person that the real motivation of a cashless society is not to fight crime or corruption or collect more taxes, it's for control. Once this control has been exercised, there will be no escape from the dystopia that ensues. The scariest part is that the average person won't realise this until it's too late. As we mentioned in our video about fast payment systems, these cashless payment methods are just too convenient. They will be voluntarily adopted, and it's only when controls are imposed that people will realise their fatal error. The silver lining is that Sweden provides a playbook for what we can expect our governments to do as part of their push towards a cashless society, and how to protect against it. First, they need an excuse. For Sweden, it was the 2008 financial crisis. For everyone else, it might be the next financial crisis. Second, they need to make cashless payments as appealing as possible. To clarify, by they, I mean the governments, central banks, commercial banks, and payment processors. As we've seen in Sweden, they will work in unison to introduce solutions that are analogous to Swish, the phone payment platform. Third, they need to make it harder to access cash. Based on what we've seen in Sweden, this will involve requiring all existing coins and banknotes to be exchanged for new ones. It will also involve removing ATMs, introducing cashless bank branches, and making it very difficult to deal with cash at the bank. Chances are that you've noticed all of the above happening in your country to some degree. The only exception might be the return of existing coins and banknotes. This will be extremely difficult to do in larger countries, particularly those with lots of currency in circulation, like the United States or the EU countries. But it will be necessary if these countries want to go truly cashless. Note that by this point, it's not a question of if they want to, they must if they want to maintain financial stability. Centralizing the financial system is the only way. The US, the EU and others will need to find some way to get rid of cash. We've long believed that the only way you can get rid of cash in these countries is to inflate it away, to make the cash in circulation worthless to the point that there's no point in holding it. However, we're starting to think that it could be a combination of inflation and incentives via interest rates. Take a second to consider that interest rates are at their highest levels in decades. Assuming they stay this high, or even go higher, then it will eventually incentivize large holders of physical cash to go to the bank and earn a yield on their massive cash pile, particularly if there's lots of inflation too. If you watched our video about the man who predicted everything, you'll know we could very well be entering a world of higher inflation and higher interest rates. Again, this would cause cash to flood into banks. Once enough cash is in the bank, they can get rid of the rest with forced currency exchange. All in the name of safety. Now, this brings me to the big question, and that's what you can do to make sure you don't end up in the dystopian version of the cashless society that most countries are not so subtly rushing towards. The answer is twofold. Enshrine access to cash in law and use utopian cashless payment systems instead. Regarding access to cash, it's important to remember that having the right to pay for things in cash doesn't necessarily mean that you have the right to access said cash. To ensure that cash payments remain an option, you need to ensure that both the access and the payment are enshrined in law. It's also important to note that access to cash is not always something that you can vote to change. 
Last I checked, you can't vote to prevent the central bank from forcing the exchange of all banknotes in circulation on the grounds of combating counterfeiting or whatever else. If it even can be done, it won't be easy to do, that's for sure. Not only that, but advocating for enshrining cash access and use into law could have unwanted social repercussions, and it could backfire if your advocacy fails. Look no further than Austria for evidence of that. The mainstream media is painting people pushing for cash protections as right-wing. Make no mistake, in the kind of cashless society most countries are pushing for, what you've said and what you've done will eventually be used to limit what you can do with your money. You'll be labelled as high risk because your non-compliance is fundamentally threatening the fragile financial system. The scariest part is that advocating for cash access and use won't be sufficient to escape a cashless society. As I mentioned in the introduction, cashless payments are just more convenient. Going cashless is inevitable given the circumstances, regardless of the laws. People will naturally stop using cash. But going cashless doesn't have to be dystopian. It can be something closer to utopian if it's done using decentralized digital currencies that can't be controlled by anyone, such as some cryptocurrencies. As I mentioned earlier, though, crypto has an Achilles heel, and that's that all transactions are traceable. For those unaware, financial privacy is required for financial freedom. That's because even if the government or central bank can't control your transactions, being able to see them means they can control you in other ways. For instance, coerce those you transact with or limit your access to credit. And for those unfamiliar, financial freedom doesn't mean having lots of money. Financial freedom means being in control of your assets and deciding when and how they're spent. This is something that is slowly disappearing from the digitized financial system, and it will be completely gone if we go cashless. That is, unless the cashless solution is decentralized and private. In case the reaction to Facebook's Libra didn't make it clear enough, any kind of cashless solution that competes with CBDCs will be significantly restricted by governments and central banks. And it would be game over if CBDCs were adopted instead. But it looks like that's the game we're all playing. Someone will lose. If we play wisely, though, we may just be able to win. And that's all for today's video. If you found it informative, smash that like button to let us know. If you want to make sure you stay informed, subscribe to the channel and ping that notification bell. And if you want to help inform others, be sure to share this video with them. If you're already accumulating your utopian cryptos in preparation for the inevitable cashless society, the Coin Bureau Deals page can help. It's got up to $40,000 of bonuses on the best crypto exchanges and the biggest discounts on the most secure hardware wallets. The link to that is in the description. As always, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Till then, stay cool, stay safe, and stay crypto. Thank you.